Well, I actually really like to think of myself as a, as a normal guy. Um, I do have a really good job. I'm a, uh, like Vaughan said, I'm an airline pilot within New Zealand, and it's a, it's a great company to work for. I've got an amazing family. I've got an awesome wife, three really cool kids. But there's something people don't really know about me. I don't actually like heights. <laughs> and my kids think this is really hilarious because Dad squealed on the roller coaster, but then Dad climbed Mount Everest. But I've been blessed with this ability to overcome some really big challenges to achieve some um, really cool stuff. And it all began when I was age 13, and I was a young boy, and I wanted to be an Air New Zealand pilot. Not any pilot, an Air New Zealand pilot. The only problem was I was very, very average at school. So I went round and I found the smartest kid in the school, and I asked him how long he's going to study for, for his exam. He said, 20 minutes. <laughs> I thought, great. So I went and studied for 20 minutes. <laughs> I turned up, sat the exam, and I got 46%, and I failed. And it made me really mad. So the next fortnight, we had another exam, and I studied for four hours. And I got 96%, and I topped the class. And from that day on, I worked out it wasn't how brainy I was, it was how hard I was willing to try. And from that day, I just applied that to everything I did. The next part of trying to become a pilot was I needed some money. So I went up to the uh, local supermarket and I got a job packing shelves after school. And after 10 years of really hard work, I managed to get uh, accepted into the airline as an Air New Zealand pilot. Unknowingly, in those early days, I'd stumbled across a technique that would allow me to go on through my life and achieve some really cool things. And it's really simple. It's get a strong plan and then break it down into small parts. But it wasn't all smooth sailing. So to get into the airline, you have to get some experience. So I got my first job at a small airline flying out to Great Barrier Island. And I loved that job, it was fantastic. After about two years, an opportunity came up to ferry an aeroplane back from the United States, back to New Zealand, a Twin Otter, which is about a 21-seater aircraft, quite a big, big aeroplane. Three of us went up to America to pick it up. We did all the appropriate checks, we got all the engineering certified certifications we needed, everything was done. And we started flying across to Hawaii, and we got past halfway, and then everything started going wrong. The really large fuel tanks that are inside the um, aircraft started to flow really slow, and then they completely stopped. Now, we had to come up with a plan really, really quickly. So I crawled across the back, and I cut the fuel lines at the back of the aeroplane, and I started transferring fuel from the back tanks to the front tank uh, with one of the other pilots. I didn't know what plan I had, I just knew I had to do something, so that's what I started to do. But it was no good. We couldn't keep up with the demand of the engines. So I crawled into the front, into the, um, into the cockpit with the captain, and he said to me, Mike, you don't need to be here. You go down the back, but it only takes one of us. But he was a friend of mine, and I couldn't live with myself if I had just, just left him there. And I said, there's one thing I need to do. I need to write a note to my girlfriend at the time. And I wrote this note, and I put it down my underpants. And he said to me, I know it's strange, he said to me, he said, what did you do? And I said, I've written this note so that if they find my body, they'll find the last words. And he said, that's a great idea. You fly. And we didn't have an autopilot, so I'm flying. And he picks up his pen, and he starts writing, and he looks up, and he goes, what did you write? <laughs> It was quite funny, and then we shook hands, and it got really serious really quickly. So next thing, um, we had already declared an emergency. We'd put out a mayday call, and if you're going to crash anywhere, crash in America, because they have fantastic gear. They sent out two F-15 fighters to get us. A C-130 Hercules turned up, but they couldn't change our situation. And the next thing, both engines started to flame out. So we managed to change tanks onto another tank and start the engines again, but we were running on fumes. So the Hercules dropped some flares on the water in front of us, and we came down behind the Hercules, and uh, I stuck my head out the window, and I was waving the skipper down. And I pulled my head back in, and I looked at him, and he's just looking at my hands, just slowly checking forward on his instruments. And I looked up, and there was pitch black sea and pitch black sky with one flare in the middle, and you actually need two flares to get depth perception. So instinctively, I grabbed the thrust levers and pushed them up and shouted, go round. And as we turned to come back round with the flare path, his door flew open and his boot fell out. 
and this door locked shut. And we had jammed the doors open in the hope that they would snap off of the impact and it would give us some chance of getting out of the wreckage. So he shouted, you fly. So I'm flying on this side, but there's no altimeter on my side, so I had to lean over and fly between zero and the one on the altimeter. So we were skimming across the tops of the waves. We brought it back around, we handed control back over. Again, I put my head out the window and I waved them down. This time, I could smell the salt on the, on the water, and it was pitch black at night now. It was really, really terrifying. And I pulled my head back in, and I said to him, just got to close the thrust levers. And he said, I know. And I screamed at him to close them. And as he closed the thrust levers, I pulled both the fuel shutoffs, and then I grabbed both the fire extinguishers and fired those off. The aeroplane hit the water and pitched right down and we were pinned 15 feet underneath the water with the tail sticking straight up. My seat snapped off and I was crushed into the control column. My head was forced back, uh, my jaw locked open, most of my clothes were blown off in the impact, and I remember swallowing and swallowing and swallowing water and I couldn't swallow any more. And then a very, very calm thought came across my mind. And it was a, a quite a peaceful thought. It was, if you take a big, deep breath of water, you'll be at peace. And there was no fear, there was just this peaceful calm. And I took this big breath, and what I thought was going to be water, and the, at that precise moment, the aeroplane bobbed out of the water, and there was two inches in the cockpit for us to breathe. What followed was a really dramatic rescue, and the um, United States Coast Guard vectored a ship to uh, our last known position, and we signaled the ship, and they sent out a little tiny tender, and it came to pick us up. The, when we got on board the tender, it came back alongside the container ship, and they threw a little rope ladder over the side, and they said, climb the rope ladder, but do it quickly, because the boat will go away, and then we'll come back and slam into the side of the ship, and it will kill you. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's a great thing to say to someone who just rescued. So I didn't need to be told twice. I flew up the rope ladder, I collapsed onto the deck in my underpants, and I was shaking in shock, and a shiny pair of shoes appeared in front of my eyes. And it was the first officer, the first mate, and he picked me up, and he was German. And he said in his German accent, he goes, Welcome to the Columbus, Canada. Where are you from? <laughs> and I said, Thank you so much for rescuing us. We're from New Zealand. And he said, Ah, you're a Kiwi. We've rescued heaps of you Kiwis. <laughs> Now, when I got back to New Zealand, I went round to my mum's house, and my mum's a really smart lady, and she said to me, she says, Mike, if you have another incident in an aeroplane and you're not scared, you have post-traumatic stress, and you need to come and see me, and I will get you some help. So, and then she said, you're a bit of a mess, go and have a bath. So I went into her house, and I, I, I sat on this bath, and for the first time in my life, I had actually allowed myself to daydream and dream. I'd always had goals, but I'd never dreamt like this. And I dreamt of a life full of adventure. I wanted to be flying in the jungle somewhere in the world. And sometimes you've got to be careful what you wish for, because a month later, I was in Fiji, flying in the jungles there. And a month after that, I had an engine failure, and I was really scared, so I knew I was really normal. <laughs> so about a year later, I managed to get accepted by Air New Zealand into the airline, and I was flying all over the world. It was a fantastic job. I was really enjoying it. And I was age 26, and I had sort of achieved my lifetime goal. And I was a little bit lost, and I, I couldn't put my finger on it. And it was, was because I didn't have any dreams and goals. So I started thinking about it, and a friend of mine said to me that he wanted to climb Everest. And I thought he was nuts. But the more I thought about it, the more it captured me. And I had this really good technique. So I got a really strong plan. I actually went down to Wanaka and went with aspiring guides, and they turned me into a really good mountaineer. And then I started climbing all over the world. I climbed on six continents around the world, and then finally went to Everest. And after about 100 days on Everest, we came to this place. Now, this is the south summit of Everest, and on this ridge, 40 people have vanished. And I've been looking at this photograph for years. I climbed on the ridge not really fast, I was climbing with a Sherpa called Lakpa. There was just the two of us. There was no Western guide. And a, I'm right in the center there. You can see a little red suit. We went up the Hillary step, and then I remember thinking, that's the hardest part of Everest. I remember thinking, wow, I'm going to climb Everest. And I shouldn't have thought that. No sooner had I thought that, I got disorientated, 
and then my left leg collapsed, and then my right leg collapsed, and I slumped into the snow. And I remember turning around, and I'm looking straight out from the summit, of, just below the summit of Everest, consciously thinking, this is what it's like to disappear. And Lakpa knew exactly what had happened. I'd run out of oxygen, and he changed my bottle and saved my life. And if it wasn't for him, I'd still be sitting there today. It's an awesome view, but it's freezing. <laughs> I came around the corner, and I saw the summit of Everest, and I remember tears welling up in my eyes, and thinking to myself, you have worked so hard, Mike, for this. And then I remember a tear coming under my goggles, trickling down my cheek, and then something clicked. There's no space for emotion. For a start, your eyeballs are going to freeze. <laughs> It's just too dangerous. Just get up there and just... And I turned to Lakpa and I said, four photos and one phone call, and we're gone. And I took the last steps to the summit of, of Everest. <laughs> I really like this photograph because I'm not standing there triumphant. Behind those goggles, I'm extremely humbled to be standing there, and I'm extremely scared as well. And some people say, you conquered Everest, and I find that quite funny because Everest allowed me to stand there for a couple of minutes, and I escaped with my life, my fingers, and my toes. And Sir Evan Hillary summed it up beautifully. He said, the only thing we conquered was ourselves. So I came back to Kathmandu, and uh, my wife's pretty awesome, and she came up to pick me up, and I was very excited. I had the opportunity, perhaps, of getting a job the next year on Everest, and I told her about it. And she's also very smart, because she said to me, Mike, if you need to climb Everest again, don't worry, we will find a way. She didn't mean it. <laughs> But what she was doing was giving me space to work out myself that my children need a father more than I need to go and climb Mount Everest. So when I took a step back and looked at the really good things about Everest and what I loved the most, it wasn't the summit, it wasn't the mountain, it was the Sherpa people and also my climbing friends. So with her support, each time one of my children turns seven, I take them to see Everest with me, and we trek over 100 kilometers, and you can't drag a seven-year-old that far. It has to be fun, so I applied the same technique I broke it down into small parts, one village at a time. And I tell you what, it's just priceless when you see the Sherpa people interacting with, you, with the seven-year-old. But adventure's in my veins, so I started looking for another, another adventure, something that wasn't um, as dangerous as Everest, and I read a book called Mad, Bad and Dangerous to Know by Sir Randolph Fiennes. And he was the first man ever to do this, to run seven marathons in seven days on seven continents. And this was crazy. I'd never run a marathon in my life. I'd never even, even run half a marathon. But it had captured me, and it seemed so impossible. So I got a really strong plan. I got a logo. I got a website. I even got a sponsor. And then I went for my first run. <laughs> my hero is this guy. His name's um, Rod Dixon, and he won the 1983 New York Marathon. So I thought, off I went. I ran about five kilometers. My feet hurt. My knees hurt. My back hurt. I couldn't run. I had to walk home. <laughs> it didn't worry me because I had this strong, strong plan. And all I did is I broke it down to the tiniest part, and I literally learned to run off YouTube. I took my shoes and socks off, and I ran up and down on the pavement, learning where to strike my feet. And before long, I turned into this guy. Now, I wanted to do this for a cause greater than oneself. I wanted to um, always give more than I take in this life. So I went to Kids Care New Zealand, and they're a fantastic charity, and they help underprivileged New Zealand children. And I was running and raising money for that charity. So the idea was to go to the Falkland Islands, start my stopwatch, run a marathon, over to uh, Santiago, up to Los Angeles, literally off the aeroplane and then running back onto the aeroplane, then to London, Casablanca, Hong Kong, and then finally, finally coming home. You can imagine how many times I got overwhelmed on this project. Sometimes the thought of running one marathon again, let alone four or five, was just overwhelming. And I didn't focus on that. I focused on the next moment, the next small part, whether it was stretching or eating. And then that turned into momentum, and then I just found my way. I ran the last four kilometers with 200 of my friends back in, in Auckland here, and the last one kilometer was very, very special for me. I ran with my three kids and my wife, 
And we crossed the finish line, it was really magic. I love adventure, and I still go out and do all sorts of adventures, some of it on my own, and some of it with my family. And there's always risk, and there's risk involved in everything we do, but not like the risks on Everest. And if there's one thing I've learned, is life is really short. And for me, I make the most of that by getting a strong plan and breaking it into small parts. Thank you very much. <laughs>